Hey guys, so today we're going to go through another quick practical skills video. Um, this week we're looking at muscle strength testing, or more specifically some common clinical assessments that you guys might come across um, when assessing the strength of a muscle. Um, and these are done using either no equipment or some basic portable equipment. So not really lab-based measures, but more measures you guys might come across in a clinical setting. Firstly, I want to talk you through a technique called um, manual muscle testing. So we've got a few things written on the whiteboard behind me here. And this is a grading system which typically in the past has been used by physios or doctors um, to use in a clinical population to grade the strength of a muscle contraction. I'll just talk you through um, the, the grading system first of all. So the way it works is it's graded by a therapist out of five. Starting at the top, to get a five when we're assessing a certain muscle, you'd be assessing can it contract through full range of motion, against gravity, and against what we call full or complete resistance. So an example would be if we were testing elbow flexion or the strength of muscles like the biceps, can the muscle contract, firstly, against gravity, moving through full range of motion, and then if resistance is applied by you know, a therapist, pushing against it, maximal resistance, it can still move through that range of motion, no problems. So that is where you get a five. As we move down though, we get to a four, we can still move through full range of motion against gravity, and this time less resistance. So with full resistance, we can't quite move, but with moderate resistance, we can. Come down to a three, full range of motion against gravity, but only when there's no resistance applied. To score a two, we can move the muscle or contract the muscle and move the joint through full range of motion, but with assistance. So this would be like the assistance of another hand or perhaps the therapist moving through on their own. They don't have the strength even to be able to move that uh, joint through range of motion using that muscle or that muscle group. Uh, a one would constitute muscle contraction, but little to no movement. So again, using the example of the elbow flexors, we can contract that muscle, but we don't actually see any movement occurring at all, even with perhaps resist, uh, sorry, only with assistance, but on its own, contracting, we don't actually get any observable movement. And then finally, a zero is where the muscle actually can't contract at all. So, you know, you ask the patient or the person to contract the muscle, but you can't actually see or feel any underlying muscle contraction. Now, there's a few issues with this grading system. This is a bit of an old fashioned system. First and foremost, it's obviously quite subjective. So what someone would rate as a five versus a four depends on how much resistance they're applying and how strong they are, and also how strong the patient is. This is a grading system that's more applicable for very clinical populations such as neurological disease or musculoskeletal disease and disorders, things like cerebral palsy, uh, stroke patients, Parkinson's patients. So you can test different muscles, your know, lower limb, upper limb, whatever muscle it might be and use this grading system, but just be aware of those limitations because for you guys working with an athletic population potentially, most people will be scoring either a four or a five even when they have presence of slight niggles and musculoskeletal injuries, such as say a torn hamstring muscle, they still might be able to contract against resistance. They just might hurt a little bit. So they're still gonna score a four or a five here. So that's some of the limitations of this system. Now, this is where another technique comes into play where we can be slightly more objective. So this is obviously got numbers applied to it, but it's still quite subjective. So if we want to use some equipment, this is something that we're going to go through in the labs in week four. We can use a technique called handheld dynamometry, which is using a small portable device called a handheld dynamometer, which basically consists of a force sensor, which is inside this little handheld unit. And we can place that on the point of interest to apply uh, resistance to a contraction. And then we actually get a score in either newtons of force or kilograms of force to rate or give an objective uh, measure of that, that muscle strength. So we won't go too much into the ins and outs of the technique of performing handheld dynamometry, that's something we'll do in the lab. I just want to introduce you to, firstly, the equipment, and then the two types of tests we can perform with the handheld dyno. So just on myself, quite simply, what we can do here is uh, look at my elbow flexor strength. So from a relaxed, neutral position of the elbow, what we can actually do is apply the handheld dynamometer to the distal aspect of the joint and we press down and apply resistance. You hear a few beeps going on and that's just the dynamometer reading. 
But first and foremost, if we want to perform a what's called a make test, we place the dynamometer over the distal aspect of the joint and we apply some resistance, but then we just ask the patient to then push up against that resistance as hard as they can. And we might sustain that for say three to five seconds and gradually build up that force. As the tester, you would just hold that resistance there. So that's what's called a make test. The other type of test we can perform is called a break test. And what we do in a break test, same thing to start off, we build up the force, so the participant's building up, and then the tester actually presses against to the point where the tester actually breaks the force of the participant. So again, we're building up, and then the tester breaks the force, and so the difference between a make and a break test is the break test is a little bit more maximal and actually tends to give us a slightly more reliable uh, value and also a higher value compared to a make test. Um, there's again a few issues with handheld dynamometry. It is dependent on the clinician or the tester, their experience and their skill with using the device and also how you position your body. You also got to consider you know, the size of the person, one the tester and then also the person that you're testing. So if you're a little puny man like me, you might struggle against a really big athlete to hold down a big muscle group, but a smaller muscle group might be a little bit easier. Vice versa, if you're quite strong, you might be able to overpower that person in a break test, therefore you get a more reliable reading. So there's considerations um, that you need to factor in when you're looking at different types of uh, strength testing. Just finally, without equipment as well, one thing we can use manual muscle testing for without this grading system, we can also differentiate between different muscles in terms of looking at perhaps the source of pain. Again, maybe in a clinical population or could it even be an athletic population with a sporting injury. So an example here would be something like golfer's elbow, where we have irritation to the flexor tendons uh, in the forearm. So we know the flexor muscles of our wrist attach up here in our medial epicondyle. Let's imagine we've got a patient who's reporting pain in this area and we can then perform a manual muscle test to see what movements provocate pain. For example, we could look at wrist flexion, we can apply resistance to wrist flexion and ask the person, does that hurt? And they say, yes, it does, it hurts in that spot there. Whereas if you were to perform wrist extension, no, it doesn't hurt on that medial epicondyle, they don't have pain, well, then you know the problem's coming from the wrist flexor muscles to start with. Then what we might need to do is differentiate between say flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis. So then we can use our anatomical knowledge of our muscle actions and apply resistance to those actions and see what happens. So for flexor carpi ulnaris, we could get the participant then to ulna deviate and apply resistance to that movement of ulna deviation. And they might say, no, that doesn't really hurt as bad. Whereas when they go and radially deviate, they get a reproduction of that pain again. So now we're starting to narrow in. We know that wrist flexion and radial deviation are painful. Therefore, our flexor carpi radialis may be the muscle that we have an issue with or an injury or something like that. So that's just another application of manual muscle testing. Once again, we'll go through some of these techniques in the lab in week four, but hopefully that just gives you guys a bit of a head start as to what those techniques are and when we might use them.